Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the NutraCast podcast, BL Biolabs Supplement Manufacturing Podcast. My name is Andrew Barninger, your host, and I'm joined here with Natalie Vollen. She is a business development executive at BL Biolab. And right now we're going to pick up on our where we ended last time, which is um, the use of AI in supplement manufacturing. Andrew, do you think AI is ever going to replace formulators? I don't think completely because when it comes to the formulation process especially when we get into research and development like actually taking what we've developed theoretically and turning it into a uh, a product that can be consumed um i don't think it will ever be completely re replaced but the the most difficult parts which is actually formulating the supplement for e efficacy or to be effective that could definitely be replaced by AI. It um, could probably help you to save some time for the formulation process and this kind of stuff. Yeah, because when a customer says, I want 200% of all of these um, various vitamins and minerals, I generally have to look up, all right, well, it's 200% of the RDI, recommended daily intake. Um, it's how much you should be taking of vitamins and minerals on a daily basis as per, it includes the FDA, the USDA and the NIH, um, they kind of work together to gather all this information. But I generally have to, have to look that stuff up. I mean, there's some things I can recall from memory, but a lot of the times it's just like, oh, what's the RDI for this ingredient? And I got to look it up real quick. Type into some type of system that says, develop me a supplement with the 200% uh, of the RDI for all of these ingredients. It'll just spit it out. Um, and then I can get more specific that says, okay, well, you gave me the RDI and maybe at 200%, but now give me what research says about the clinical efficacy of each individual ingredient. Maybe some of them are higher and some of them are lower based on clinical evidence. Um, so yeah, it could definitely help with the theoretical formulation process. But then once you take that information and maybe you want to put it in a tablet or a capsule. Well, you have a lot of environmental inputs, environmental variables that are difficult for a computer to basically tell you. In like, which you cannot replace the human. That's the yeah. thing. Okay, okay, good. And if we're talking generally about marketing and selling the products that we produce at our facility, so like, you know, it's on our customer side, but what's your input on this topic? Like what would be a good way to market the supplements that you create? Marketing was never, marketing, advertising, content development was never really my strong suit. But you know, sometimes customers ask for the benefits. That's something they need mm. from you. Yeah. Because, you know, there's something that they can base their commercials and, you know, all the materials, marketing, listing on Amazon, whatever, like this stuff that they're usually kind of looking for your input as a chemist. Yeah, so if we have a supplement that has 15 ingredients, well, for me to go through every single ingredient and say, all right, well, here's the benefits of this. Here's the benefits of this. Here's the benefits of this. It takes a long time. Um, like I can just go on Google and copy and paste stuff, but it's generally not a lot of, not very accurate. So what I can do with um, various AI tools to, to help me facilitate that and actually give the customer a good explanation is okay, I'm using this ingredient at this dose. Find me evidence to su support why this ingredient, this dose is best. Give me uh, three different citations. So now it'll actually cite what I'm saying. So it's, it's not just randomly pulling information. It's actually reading some citations and saying, this study says this, this study says this, and this study says this. And then I can even get a little bit more detailed and say, all right, well, now how do these three ingredients operate together to increase the benefits or the efficacy of the supplement. So, so when it, you provide this data to the customer, it's kind of enough for them to base their commercials and other materials on this information? Yeah, I mean, because with most advertising or marketing, it's generally like one-liners or like a couple words, maybe a couple paragraphs, maybe a couple sentences. But like, as you've seen before, sometimes I've given like a dissertation of information yeah. and from that, they can probably pull a year or two's worth of marketing and advertising from that information just with the density of what I gave them. And a lot of times I'm using some type of AI tool to do that just because, as I mentioned, it would take me forever to read and parse through the research. I mean, I can tell you that vitamin C is good for scurvy, but 
vitamin C is also used in all of these other things that I may not know offhand. So that's where it's good to have that information. Awesome that AI can help you save mm -hmm. your time. And yeah. time is very expensive when mm -hmm. it comes to R&D, right? Yep. Okay, let's just move on to our next topic. Today, uh, I want to discuss the best vitamins for growing children. Like most of us have kids, right? Mm -hmm. And this is very vital to understand what's the best supplement, you know, we can mm -hmm. use and give our kids for them to, you know, grow and be healthy. So I believe that starts more perinatal, so before childbirth. Um, but probably the most important would be iron and folic acid. I want to point out that this is not medical advice. Uh, this is just based on evidence that I've read. I do have a dietetics background, clinical dietetics background, but I'm not a dietitian. Um, but from what I've read, um, it would be iron and folic acid, both to um, help with the uh, development of the child from a neurological perspective and to prevent any, call them congenital diseases um, or the development of the baby before they're born. So folic acid and iron would probably be the best. That's why a lot of prenatal vitamins will call that out with folate or with iron. Uh, just because we know that they're important for the development of the child. And then after the child's born, babies who breastfeed um, have less incidence of allergies as they develop. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and there's a lot of perspectives on why that may be. But then um, in a developing child, you'll probably notice that a lot of our foods are fortified with B vitamins and iron. Mm -hmm. And that's because all of those are important for the development of a child. In D3, they always uh, say that like you have to give your child D3 vitamin since birth pretty much, even um, the child is breastfed, for example. That's just because I believe it's 73 or 80% of the US population is deficient in vitamin D. Uh, so that's probably why they recommend vitamin D. But like, is it critical for- Oh yeah, 100%, um, both for cognitive development and growing bones. So absorbing calcium, it, you need vitamin D to facilitate that process. So vitamin D um, helps with cognitive and bone health. So that's why it's most likely recommended for um, young kids. Do you give any supplements to your child? I give him because he only eats like white foods, like crackers and bread. He's the pickiest child I've ever seen in my life. It drives me insane. Oh. Um, like I make these amazing meals and he just wants to eat chicken nuggets and french fries drives me crazy um but i do give him some nutrients so i give him choline uh for brain development um i also give him iron because like i said all he eats is chicken nuggets and french fries so i make sure he's getting uh choline and iron and then when it comes like i said most foods are fortified especially packaged foods and as much as i don't like to admit he does eat a little more packaged foods than i would like so I know when it comes to B vitamins, he's fine. Um, but yeah, they're the two primary things that I give him. To supplement his diet? Yeah. Okay, got it. And if we think about um, supplements that there are on the market, like mm -hmm. for example, I know that there are a lot of gummies that are mm -hmm. promoted for kids. Do you think it's a good option to give gummies to kids or not really? So the, the biggest concern I have with gummies is to make a gummy, whether it's with gelatin, um, which would be an animal source, or a vegan, which generally they use carrageenan or, um, and various types of gums to make them vegan, the biggest issue I have with those is the cooking process. So whether you're using gelatin or a vegan source, um, and that's to make the, the gummy coagulate and stay, stay in shape, um, whether you use either one there's a cooking process so depending on when they add those vitamins and nutrients to the mixture during the cooking process whether it's before cooking or after cooking um, it may destroy them so a lot of um, supplemental forms of vitamins and minerals are heat sensitive so that's why i have a concern with with gummies they may not be the best delivery method um i would actually advise doing more cold processed liquids. So maybe a multivitamin liquid that um, is cold processed versus a gummy because there's really no getting around the, the heating step. And you don't really know if gummies um, will, if, if they add the vitamins and minerals before or after cooking. So it might be more like a kind of dessert cookie stuff, not really a supplement yeah. which gives benefits for yeah. health. 
Tell me how to formulate the perfect supplement for athletes. That's really subjective. Um, kind of depends on what sport they're doing. Uh, but a lot of athletes need similar things. So that would be like electrolytes, fluids, and um, some type of muscle repair supplement. Aminos. Amino acids, things like that. Um, so like when formulating with for, for athletes, I tend to keep like things like sodium high. So um, athletes need a lot of sodium. They need a lot of different electrolytes. So like salt's your best friend when we're working with athletes. Um, also, depending on the type of athlete they are, they, um, we don't have to be as, like a lot of people want supplements that have like no sugar, or no carbs, or like low fat. Working with athletes is a lot different because especially if you're working with a high level athlete, um, like something for like a professional athlete or a collegiate athlete, those things are less important because they consume so much food on a daily basis that- But what vitamins and minerals are important particularly for athletes? So as I mentioned, electrolytes, um, I would also say any complex of multivitamins. So vitamin A, vitamin C, B vitamins, things like that, simply because uh, they, they have such higher nutritional needs than most people, uh, just because they're burning through so many calories, they're, they're sweating so much. So really your electrolytes, your vitamins and minerals, um, and maybe some type of muscle recovery ingredient like creatine is the daily value uh, a lot different between like you know regular human who doesn't do any sports and athlete yeah and i would even say there's a difference between people who go to the gym regularly and athletes due to like metabolic processes or yeah, yeah. um if you've ever ever been around like professional athletes or even collegiate athletes they're insane they're just crazy humans um i got to work with a bunch of football players um who were they were D1 football players um, going to the NFL combine to get drafted. So like these guys were almost NFL level, um, but they trained like they were at the NFL level. It was just insane. I mean, they were eating five, 6,000 calories a day, consuming like multiple gallons of, of fluid. Um, I've never seen somebody in real life like run um, a, a four second 40 yard dash. It was, in, they're just insane. So like, those guys rules really don't apply whatever they need to do to 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 continue to perform so like it's a lot of carbs lots of fats lots of proteins um electrolytes vitamins and minerals just um whatever it is for the normal person you kind of just got to gauge it based on um how they're performing their performance is going down give them a little bit more see if you can bring their performance up but now if you're just talking about the the daily gym goer, their needs really aren't that different than people who are sedentary. Um, so you can formulate like athletic supplements as you would formulate for like a general multivitamin, just for the basic needs of people. But it would be really just like your core ingredients. So like creatine, a protein, or a carbohydrate supplement, things like that, things that just help them recover get stronger, get faster. Something like more regular that probably wouldn't hurt anyone to take yeah. on a daily basis. Okay. I remember the days when like I was young and beautiful and <laughs> dated a professional rugby player. Okay. And he was taking a lot of different supplements and even like, you know, IVs, this type of stuff, uh -huh. you know, through that you can take different like vitamins and minerals. When it comes to this professional level of mm -hmm. sport, um, can you formulate a supplement that really can, you know, boost your performance, um, you know, for your sport? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when it, from a manufacturing perspective, though, it's actually more important that, that the, the supplement is free of things that aren't banned. So in the U.S., we have, well, actually, I think it's, it's a world organization called WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency. And basically, it has a list of ingredients that professional athletes around the world, whether, whether it be football or soccer, as Americans would call it, or um, rugby or hockey, those are all like big international sports. Um, WADA has a list of ingredients that are completely banned, which most athletes around the world can't take. And how does it work? Like, is the customer should let you know that like we need to avoid this banned ingredients because we're aiming for professional athletes mm -hmm. and we need to be sure like 
you know, honestly, I've never came mm -hmm. across this type of request. Have you ever gotten this type of request? Yeah. So if, if you're formulating a supplement, if you're a brand and you're formulating supplements for professional or collegiate athletes, they actually need to be uh, one of two certifications. Uh, there's probably more, but these are the two that I know I'm very familiar with, which is NSF Sport or um, Informed Sport. And there are two, NSF um, is- We're NSF certified. Is it yeah. the thing or something different? It's different. Different. Um, it's another level of detail. So when you make an NSF um, sport supplement that has the NSF sport logo on the bottle, unlike regular supplements that don't need to be tested every single time, NSF sports supplements need to be tested for this list of banned substances. And the list is huge. It's like hundreds of ingredients. But as you said, like different sport has mm -hmm. different banned lists. Like for example, for rugby players, it's the one for generally football, it's the same soccer, list. It's the same. Yeah, it's it's generally the same. Um, a lot of these organizations share information. So it's like if WADA bans this, then the NCAA is also going to ban this um, because they share a lot of information. It's really just like, why go research ourselves when this person or this organization already did all the work for us? Let's just take what they did and say, all right, we can't use these ingredients either. So I know from working with professional athletes, they were super particular about the supplements. If it was not informed sport or NSF certified, they wouldn't take it. it. It doesn't even matter if they were in their off season. They just wouldn't take it. They didn't want to get um the opportunity for the maybe whatever sport they play like say they're a collegiate softball player they didn't want the ncaa to randomly drug test them and them fail because they were taking some random supplement that was not certified but for example we produce drug detox supplement which can help you you know get rid of this type of stuff is it gonna help or not really would you recommend it's a it's a deep question um, because there's a lot of things that you can do to skew. Once again, I'm not a doctor. Actually, I am. And you know, <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor. Um, there's a lot of things you can do to skew those tests, like drug tests. Um, but when it comes to talking about supplements, we're talking about two different types of drugs. Like we're not talking about things like methamphetamine or marijuana. We're talking about things like um, anabolic steroids, the like drug detox supplements, they don't really work on, on like the steroids. They, they, cause those are a totally different class of drugs. They're going to help you to get rid of the type of like drugs, like, like recreational drugs. drugs. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that, that really doesn't apply to, um, sports. sports. Yeah. So they're still going to catch them. Yeah. Most likely. Uh, I mean, they, they, they have tests that test for like the most specific things that you really can't get rid of in your body. So that's why it's important for supplements for athletes to be manufactured under like the strictest guidelines, like cleaning procedures in the facility need to be super strict, testing procedures where we source the ingredients and they, they all need to be super strict so that when we sell it to a company who wants to buy a supplement that's for professional or collegiate athletes, it meets all our requirements. And uh, we get a lot of requests for pre-workouts and mm -hmm. post-workouts for athletes and just, you know, for um, basic for adults. Mm -hmm. um, what are your recommendations when it comes to formulating? Like, what are the best uh, pre- and post-workouts? I mean, from an ingredient perspective, I have my opinions on what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there. But I think from a formulation perspective and like a marketing perspective, it's got to taste good. That's the biggest thing. I mean, if you notice, that's where we spend most of our time. Like throwing a formula together, especially for a topic that I know so much about, like athletic performance, it's easy. It, it's easy. It, I'm just like, okay, this ingredient, this one, this one, and this one. And I mean, there's even been times when we've made a sample of something for a customer and they're like, it doesn't work. And I'm like, yeah, because you have a bad formula. And then I'll go in and reformulate their product. I'm like, all right, try this because this is more of what you're looking for. A lot of people formulate based on what everybody else is doing, not on, not on what's actually a good ingredient for a supplement. So, but then 
when it gets to the flavoring step, I mean, as you notice, that's where we spend most of our time. Yeah, and I want to give compliments to our team, you know, the, <laughs> um, the amount of good products that <laughs> we've been recently, you know, given to our clients is tremendous <laughs> and just the taste is good. <laughs> Like me personally, I all my life I hated protein drinks and all this type of stuff. But mm -hmm. when I tried some drinks that we created, like in our lab, mm -hmm. they taste good. So yeah. you have no problem actually drinking them. It's mm -hmm. not like you. Yeah. 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 So you enjoy, mm -hmm. and I th I think this is the main goal. Like you know, for us to create a product that is going to be you know sold well mm -hmm. by our customers and also is going to be you know pleasant so mm -hmm. a lot of good reviews and it's the, like you don't have to even put huge amount of money into marketing if mm -hmm. you create a good product that's just going to be you know recommended by different clients and yeah and that's um i think from anybody listening to this wants to um wants to create their own supplement brand and you want to make flavored products things that you want people to drink or eat understand that from the formulation perspective flavoring is the most difficult thing um because if you taste a lot of these raw ingredients in their just raw form they're the most disgusting things ever like caffeine if you put like raw caffeine on your tongue you're going to be tasting it for the next hour and a half and you won't be able to taste anything else because it's just bitter and tannic and it just like makes your tongue feel like sandpaper yeah that's why i don't drink coffee i don't understand why people do yeah so that's why the the flavoring step is the most difficult so like if you have, if a, a manufacturer says all right you'll get your product in eight to twelve weeks well that's assuming that you already have the flavor that you want now add another four to six weeks if you want a different flavor because for example, BL Biolab, and most manufacturers like BL Biolab do this, they don't make flavors in house. Making flavors is a totally different business, like making powdered flavors or liquid flavors. That's a totally different business that requires a different skill set, it requires different manufacturing procedures, different certifications. So making flavors is incredibly difficult. So a lot of manufacturers will use flavor companies that supply flavors. But like most things, like it, you, if you've tasted three different chocolate protein powders, you've gotten three different chocolate flavors. It's because every flavor is subjective. So when I reach out to a flavor house, if I reach out to three different flavor house and ask, and ask for a blue raspberry, I'm going to get three different blue raspberries. So we may go through a round of flavoring with a customer and they're like, I like this apple flavor, but I don't like this blue raspberry. So we'll be like, okay, which ones, which flavors do we use? And then we'll be like, okay, well, they didn't like this blue raspberry. Let's try this other company and see if they like this. And they might like that. And they might like that one. But all we did was maybe everything else stayed the same. All we did was switch the company that made the blue raspberry and they automatically like it. So that's why flavoring is so difficult. And the flavors that we use, they're like organic, natural, and like pretty good stuff. Because yeah. like there is a stigma, you know, that like if you add flavors mm -hmm. or colorings or something, mm -hmm. it's gonna, you know, make the product not really natural mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe even toxic. I don't think it's true, isn't it? Um, there's certain ingredients that have bad stigmas, like artificial colors. We don't use really any artificial colors simply because... I don't like going through that with the customer where maybe we get to the end and they're like, oh, can we say this is all natural? And I'm like, well, no, we used blue number one, which is a synthetic color. And they're like, well, we don't want that. I'm like, all right, well, then we got to start over because now we need to switch to a natural blue color. And I, I keep talking about spirulina or what are we using the blue butterfly? Yeah. So you could use like blue spirulina or blue butter, butterfly powder. The problem is, is you need maybe 50 to hundred times more of that ingredient to get the same blue color. And it's also, it could be 10 times the price. So now your pricing changes, your serving sizes changes, your, your bottle might change depending on how much we had to add. Cause when you're talking about synthetic colors, you add a very small amount. So I'm talking about like, if you have a serving size of 10 grams, 
I'm talking about microgram doses of coloring to get the color that you want. Now, if you switch to like um, a blue spirulina, you might need 10 milligrams. But you still go in this natural road. Like yeah. you're not using the chemical mm -hmm. alternatives, right? Yeah. I mean, from 15 years ago to now, the all the options you have with more natural ingredients, the, the portfolio of natural options is like a hundredfold what it was 15 years ago. I mean, you have natural, you can get citric acid from various sources now where before it mainly came from corn um, or potato starch now you can get citric acid from things like cassava or random other plants that have um, like root vegetables that have a lot of starch so i mean we can even get specific with the type of acids we use maybe it comes from this source and not this source so the options for formulation and keeping your product as natural as you want or as artificial as you want maybe you want maybe you don't care about the natural stuff well that actually just makes flavoring and product development easier because now we don't have to find substitutes for synthetic ingredients to make them natural cut that and go to this the, oh, I'm, sorry i'm talking really fast and i'm losing i'm no, 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 can't good. catch my breath we'll and i don't want to like breathe into the microphone yeah the options you have for when it comes to synthetic versus natural are totally different um and to be honest, when it comes to synthetic ingredients, they're so easy to use. We know that using a synthetic flavor, synthetic color is going to produce the exact result we want because they're, they're designed to be hyper-specific but really diverse, so they have a lot of functionality. Natural ingredients, not as much. Natural ingredients may only work in certain formulations. For example, a lot of natural colors depend on the pH of the product. So like, let me give you an example. You're making an orange supplement. Well, orange comes from, you, you assume it's like oranges. So oranges are really acidic. So now you can add, dump a lot of acid into that product like citric acid or malic acid to make it really acidic. And then when you add a natural color in there, maybe the color comes from like turmeric. Um, that color is going to change depending on how acidic your product is. It's going to be brighter if you have a really acidic product and it's going to be more mute, so less orange, more flat, if you have a less acidic product. But now let's talk about like a, I don't know, like a raspberry product. Raspberries don't have a lot of acid in them, but if you want like a really vibrant raspberry color, uh, you might need a lot of add a lot of acid to that product to make the color more vibrant and pop more but it may not be aligned with the um the flavor of the product you might have a raspberry flavor that's too acidic so that's where getting working with natural colors and flavors and natural excipients um excipients being the things we add to supplements to make them work better so it's like the whole new game of mm -hmm. getting the perfect color, mm -hmm. getting a good flavor. Um, recently, we've been creating mini supplements with just like the powder of different colors so it looks nice mm -hmm. inside the capsule. Mm -hmm. And, you know, customer can give a request for like make it light shade of blue mm -hmm. or like slightly purple or mm -hmm. this or this. And how long does it take for you to get this perfect color that they're looking, you know, from the color palette? Okay. so. When it comes to like, if you have a capsule or a tablet that you want colored, so you can get a colored capsule. No, no, no. I'm talking when the powder is yeah, colored. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get jump to that point. All right. But most companies just offer like, if you're talking about blue, most companies just offer two blues. They offer a dark blue and a light blue. Nothing in between. You can do stuff in between, but now you need to custom order capsules and the MOQ minimum order quantity on custom order capsules, millions. you're talking about millions. Um, I think the smallest volume I've ever seen was 10 million capsules uh, if you wanted a custom color. But there's a way around that in R&D and that's we can use a clear capsule, which most ca capsules are clear. We, most, we use clear capsules for most things. 
but we can actually color the powder. So if it's something, if it's like a white powder, we can actually add some blue color to it in the form of like blue butterfly, uh, pea, blue pea butterfly, something like that. Yeah. Pea butterfly powder or something like that. Um, or blue spirulina. And we can add more or less depending on like what color you want. So if you want like a dark blue, um, we could add more of it. Or if you want like a teal color like my hat, we can add less of it with a little bit of green, um, like maybe some some green spirulina or some chlorophyll. It is probably not always possible, but as you said, if the powder originally is white, yeah, it's easy. You can mm -hmm. add your colors and make what you want. But mm -hmm. if the po po powder with the ingredients you're using is dark brown mm -hmm. or, you know, some uh, other color, mm -hmm. what happens in this case? You can't do it. You can't do yeah, it. Yeah, there's... If you have, like, maybe you have, like, rhodiola and ashwagandha. Both are dark brown. But you want your product to be bright red. Well, the only thing we can do there is use a red capsule because there's nothing we can do to a brown powder to make it change color. I mean, we can make it darker. Maybe we can add something that's red to it. Uh, maybe we add beetroot to it and it makes it a different shade of brown, maybe a, a slightly red brown. Bloody brown. Like a bloody brown, like almost look like oxidized um, iron. But like, there's nothing we can do there. So when I've had customers request some really crazy things where they're like... Tell me about the crazy things. Yeah, so um, I've had customers, to what we were just talking about, they wanted a powder that was brown in a liquid form, but they wanted to make it like the flavor so they wanted the flavor to the color to correspond to the flavor but then their product had like mushrooms in it so like mushrooms most mushrooms are dark like if you look at like cordyceps or reishi or um lion's mane lion's mane they're all dark so if you mix them together you put them in water you're going to have something that looks like coffee you can't modify the color of that. There's nothing you can do. I mean... What about the taste? Probably also it's not going to be very well, pleasant. The good thing about mushrooms is they actually don't taste bad. They, they have a pretty... They taste like mushrooms, but they're a pretty neutral taste. So I worked on something about two weeks ago where the person wanted um, 10 grams of beetroot powder, which is... That's a lot of beetroot. And two grams of cordyceps, cordyceps mushroom. So you mix the powder, it literally looked like a super super dark cabernet wine so just super dark it was it had this red vibrant hue to it but it was just dark like if you held it up to the light you couldn't see through it, it wasn't translucent and they wanted to flavor it blue raspberry and i'm like i don't know how this is going to work um so worked with it for about an hour and i was actually able to achieve a blue raspberry flavor um which surprised me i didn't know it was possible but I couldn't do anything with the color. I, I, there's no way I could have ever made that blue because it was already dark red. You can't go to blue from dark red. Yeah. If you look at like your primary colors, it just doesn't work. So what are the other fun things or like crazy requests you're getting from customers and you're like, oh, oh. A lot of customers, more from flavor or from like no, color? No, just generally. Just generally? Yeah. Um, a lot of customers, I like to say this a lot to the the R and D team because they can they 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 feel my pain when I say it. I'm like, just because you can think of something doesn't mean that it can exist. There's a lot of cool things that people think of that just can't exist because we don't we either don't have the technology, we don't have the knowledge, or whatever it may be to make that thing exist. And by we, you mean humans or just, just bio hu uh, humans in general. There's just certain things we don't have the technology. If to humans do. can do it, BioLab can do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um but a lot of people will say, I want this formula, and maybe it's like five or six grams of ingredients, but I want it in two capsules. And there's like guidelines that you can follow that one capsule holds this much powder. And they're approximates, they're they're not accurate. Um they're accurate, but they're not precise. So they, they give you a good starting point, but it really depends on the powder 
and the how that powder operates, how it flows, all of its physical characteristics. But a lot of people are requesting crazy things like I want five grams of powder in two capsules. Like it can't be done. You can't do it. That nobody could do it because now you're just rearranging how math works. And you can't put five grams of powder in two capsules because two capsules, two even double zero capsules, which are general, there's a triple zero capsule, which is very large. BL Biolab doesn't do that because it's like. You barely can swallow it, right? Yeah, it's probably the size oh, of wow. like, yeah, it's probably about an inch and a half long. So it's huge. Uh, we don't do that just because we. Safety never, concerns, yeah. probably. Yeah, we don't have anybody requesting it. Uh, God. But we do a double zero capsule, which is the next next largest size. And you can really only, depending on the powder, like if we're talking about vitamin C, in one capsule, we could probably fit about a thousand milligrams or a gram. But if you're talking about lion's mane mushroom, we could only fit about 600 milligrams because it depends on the density of the material, its flow characteristics. If you recall from last episode, I talked a little bit about how R&D is not just putting stuff together and, and calling it a day. It's putting stuff together and then taking it out on the production floor and making sure that it can actually run, like making, making sure that the, the equipment can make the powder go into the capsule or it compresses into a tablet correctly. Because, yeah, you're re responsible for the whole process mm -hmm. from A to Z, not like you're done this part mm -hmm. to D, for example, and then yeah. you're like, bye-bye. Yeah. And that's where most of the work goes is taking this idea that a customer came up with and actually going and making it work. Okay. So like in worst case scenario, like it can't fit and mm -hmm. we tell the customer that it doesn't fit and mm -hmm. that's it. What's funny about it? I mean, did you have any examples where you just like literally laughed and or like, you know, something that doesn't happen I mean, every day, but <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be funny to most people, but it's really funny to me that like, it, it's just the, the, the crazy things that people come up with. And I'm like, where did you see this? It, like I said, it's not funny if you don't have like, it's more of an inside joke inside my own head where I look at stuff. I'm like, how did you come up with this? Because it doesn't make sense. Like, I don't even think you know what you want. You're just kind of throwing stuff at us. But usually customers who don't really like understand the whole process and more in like sales or marketing, mm -hmm. they know how to sell, but they're not really mm -hmm. like into the whole formulation process. So mm -hmm. they kind of rely on our advice mm -hmm. and yeah, they can come up with some stupid or maybe just not like they don't have enough knowledge mm -hmm. and that's why they kind of rely on us. Yeah, and that's, I, I appreciate customers that will say, hey, this is what I wanted. I don't know if it works. And I'm like, okay, well, now you've, you've, we, now we've come to a common ground where it's like, this is what you want, but you don't know how to do it. And that's where we come into play, where it's like, we know what you want and we can make it the best way that you want it. And if we can't do it the way that you want it, then we can advise you on how to modify it. And that's, that's where I appreciate working with certain customers because they're like, hey, this is what I want. Don't know if it works, but we'll, um, this is what I want to move forward with. And then we can say, all right, well, we're going to have to change X, Y, and Z. We're going to have to modify these things. And after all these changes, this is what we can do. And cus customers that are receptive to that, they're like, all right, let's do that then. And we're lucky to have the customers who are understanding and mm -hmm. who trust us. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the whole goal, like to find this balance between mm -hmm. what R&D thinks, you know, is the right thing to do and what the customer will be able to sell and like, you know, be competitive yeah. to other products mm -hmm. on the market because that's the main goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of our, I won't say a lot, but many of our customers are competing with other customers on a certain category. Uh, I know you have experience with Amazon, um, selling products on Amazon, and it's super competitive, and it's gotten more competitive over the last probably year and a half because Amazon isn't accepting as many new supplement sellers just because they got so diluted, and now Amazon's being a lot more selective. They're being more strict with their regulations and what they want, what people can actually sell. And then, so you have a couple of major players all competing with each other for certain um, keywords, um, certain different um, supplement facts panel. That's yeah. usually something that they compete with. Yeah, they they their supplement. 
because a lot of people buying supplements on Amazon, they may be re reading the description or they may have some like third party explanation of the, the supplement. But a lot of times they're just comparing supplement facts panels of three different products that are all very similar and they're trying to figure out which one they want best. So that's where a lot of our customers I know will say, hey, I want a product like this and they'll send a supplement facts panel and they're like, but you need to make it better. Yeah, so in this case, you come in and you decide what mm -hmm. to do with this supplement facts panel. Mm -hmm. So can you share like a particular example? Because uh, we have many of this mm -hmm. requests, right? Like they find a very good product and they just want to enhance it, mm -hmm. to tweak the formulation a little bit and make it even better. Mm -hmm. How do you do this? So that's where I'll look at what they're currently doing. Uh, well, the example that they send. And maybe it'll have some some vitamins and minerals, and then it'll have some type of blend on the bottom of certain botanicals. And then I'll look at it, and I'll see, and I'll determine what the purpose of the supplement is. And I'm like, oh, well, they use this type of folic acid, but if we use this one, it makes the supplement better because of X, Y, and Z. Or they use this type of vitamin B12. If we use this one, it makes it better because of X, Y, and Z. And a lot of consumers are getting more intelligent because of just like the access to information that consumers are being more specific with what they, what they purchase. Yeah, they're, they're they not watch as dedicated. a lot of TikTok and yeah. Reels, you know, so they are getting very intelligent yeah. in this. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of good information out there, but there's a lot of really poor information. But a lot of the good information about like certain dietary ingredients is actually like pretty solid. Yeah. Like because it's such a it's it's a topic that you need you need to know a lot about to talk intelligently about. So the people who put out that type of content and that type of information is generally pretty solid. I mean, I don't agree with all of it, but across the board I'm like, all right, that was a good point. So that's where I look at um customers' formulas that they want to enhance and I'll be like, all right, we we switch to this source of vitamin D, we switch this source of vitamin K and we enhance the product. And then maybe we add a little bit more of each ingredient. So now their supplement facts looks better than the other customers. And overall the, the formula is better because it has better ingredients and it has more of those better ingredients. And do you suggest to the customer like to um, have this specific uh alternative of the ingredient and like do you explain these benefits to kind of show them and explain them what's going on and like how to market this particular yeah advantage of this? normally when a customer requests that we come up with something i'll generally give some input like depending on what the customer wants um i'll be more or less elaborate so if they're not requesting it, I'll just write a little excerpt or maybe one or two sentences that say, I switched this because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah, we call it R&D notes. Yeah. And then, but if a customer's like, explain to me why, that's where uh, what I'll do is I'll dig into my, my knowledge bank or I'll go do some research and be like, all right, I used this form of folate because you're making a brain health supplement and this form of folate at this dose has been shown to do x y and z i'll cite my sources i'll give them um sometimes i'll attach the study sometimes i'll give them links to the studies and that's where i i try to get if a customer is requesting that information i want to give them as much as possible because i'm not assuming that everybody who's coming to us has this extensive knowledge of supplements and physiological and biological processes in the body. So I want to give them as much information as they, as I can to make their job better. And not only that, it helps with them coming back to us. If we're helpful and supportive in their endeavor, then they'll primarily come back to us because they're like, oh, these people, this, this company was great. They gave us good information. We were actually able to sell our product better. This is our main purpose to yeah. help them to sell their products and make their consumers happy. Yeah, because we're our, our business is dependent on their success. So like whatever we can do to support their success, we want to do. But have you ever had a fight with a customer? All the time. <laughs> Not all the time. Um, uh, 
I don't want to say all the time because it's really not all the time, but there's sometimes when customers like they say some stuff and I'm like, I don't know why you're doing this. Like I, I gave you a good explanation. I, I cited my sources. I, I gave you the best of my knowledge. And unless you have your, you have access to some information that I don't, then I'm not aware of it. Let's, let's talk about it. Please explain it to me because what you're saying doesn't make sense. And I would love to learn more. I'm really receptive, especially when I have, when people have something to teach me about a topic, because I don't, I try not to act like I know everything. Um, I may be, I may come off like that, but I'm really not trying to be. Um, but yeah, I'll get into arguments about cus with customers about certain ingredients. Um, but most of the, most of the confrontations with customers come really about serving size, probably serving size. They're like, well, our less manufacturer, and that's a topic that I would like to get into more, um, is when we're getting a product that was made at another manufacturer sent to us. Uh, maybe we can talk about that in future episodes. Yeah, that would be great. We can really like kind of dig yeah. dip into this. Um, but primarily, they're like, well, this other manufacturer did it this way, was able to produce this product. And I'm like, I wish I knew how they did it because... From my perspective, it's not possible because maybe you have too many ingredients or you these ingredients don't work well in a capsule or maybe they're, we're not going to be able to put them on a machine and run the capsule. So I'll try to explain to them, hey, these are the problems I'm facing with this formula. You may be selling it already, but I need to know exactly what that other manufacturer did. And sometimes, you know, like a customer can send us their product with like you know supplement facts panel on this product and mm -hmm. then the formula that they've been previously producing mm -hmm. at another manufacturer and they just like don't even like it's not even close yeah we have this examples right yeah we, we have the examples where we're looking at these um these formulas that other manufacturers provided and then we're looking at the supplement facts and we're like this doesn't add up this isn't the same thing so like what actually happened and the problem is it's not really we can't really call the other manufacturer and be like, hey, what did you do wrong here? Because it doesn't make sense. They're, they're not going to be receptive to that. Can we make a complaint to like NSF or something or not really? Not really. Okay. Yeah, not really. I mean, if it was a health violation, we could contact the Department of the like state agencies or st the State Department of Health or the FDA. We could. But it, that's not what we do. The, we just like, you it's know, not our business model. And yeah. <laughs> Do our job well, yeah. so no, everybody is happy with what we do, right? 100%. All right. Thank you, Andrew. It was a pleasure talking to you today. You as well. Thank you for watching this episode of NutriCast. Uh, make sure you subscribe for future notifications of future episodes, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.